The following is a production of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Sponsored by Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. Citizen Soldier, produced by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and sponsored by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. The Vietnam War was perhaps the most divisive armed conflict of the 20th century, a civil war in essence. Allies of the belligerent nations became involved to protect or advance their own interests amid the start of the Cold War. As the war escalated through the mid-1960s, it grew increasingly unpopular among the American people, many of whom openly questioned the motives and judgment of their government in committing so many troops and resources to a controversial cause. But the war raged on, and as more men were needed, more were drafted. With nearly 650,000 draftees serving in Vietnam by war's end, or about 25% of the more than 2.7 million Americans deployed. Among them was a young Tim O'Brien, who received his draft notice in 1968, immediately after graduating from McAllister College in Minnesota. Opposed to the war, O'Brien nevertheless did his duty and reported for service with the U.S. Army's AmeriCal Division as an infantryman. From 1969 to 1970, O'Brien's platoon served a tour of duty in Vietnam's Quang Nai province site of the infamous My Lai Massacre a year earlier, where he gained the experiences that would later shape his career as a best-selling author. At nearly the same time, an Ivy League athlete and Marine Corps officer named Carl Marlantis left his Rhodes Scholarship after one semester at Oxford, volunteering for active duty out of a sense of moral obligation to his friends and fellow servicemen. He too would be impacted physically and emotionally by his time in Vietnam ultimately finding a form of therapy in writing about his experiences. In critically acclaimed books like O'Brien's Going After Cacciato, The Things They Carried, and In the Lake of the Woods, and Marlantes's Matterhorn, and What It Is Like to Go to War, the two authors blur the lines between fiction and reality. Using actual details from their experiences in Vietnam, each has created powerful novels about the realities and personal emotions of war that speak to citizens and citizen soldiers alike. For his lifetime of achievement in military writing, Tim O'Brien earned the prestigious Pritzker Literature Award in 2013. I thought we'd just start out by a little background. Where were you and how did you end up in the military and in Vietnam? And not Canada? I mean, mm -hmm. sort of the whole time period and what was going on in your head then? Well, I was a graduate of McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. I had uh, been throughout my college years uh, more or less opposed to the war. Uh, I was a guy who hated Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, <laughs> and I just couldn't see how the war would ever touch me personally. I went home after graduation and immediately received the draft notice. And I had these two heads on my shoulders that summer, one head opposing the war and the other head uh, loving my country and living in a small town in southern Minnesota, a very conservative place on the prairie, um, wanting to behave with some rectitude in what seemed an impossible situation. Uh, I ended up going to the, into the Army and going to Vietnam mostly by default or forfeiture. I didn't decide one day I'm going. I just went and uh, found myself in the infantry in Vietnam as a foot soldier and walking the uh, paddies and mountains of Vietnam amidst a war that I increasingly disliked as time went on over there. Too often, I think, we, we fall into a kind of paradigm of looking at why people go off to wars. And we, when we talk about that, we almost always talk about virtuous things, you know, sacrifice for country or duty. But there's another side to why people go to war. It has to do with very personal things, 
friends, yeah. people in my hometown, what will they think of me? That sissy went to Canada. Right, yeah. And it's not always highfalutin stuff that sends people to war. It's, I think, rarely that way. I think it's more commonly deeply personal forces send you to war, fear of embarrassment. Um, it would have been embarrassing to say no to my country in the town I grew up in, deeply embarrassing, and not just to me, but to my mother. I was wondering about um, just your, your, your memories of the war, and I had this experience. I was uh, with a guy that I'd been on a terrible battle with about eight days, and uh, he and I had gotten together just a few years ago, along with another Marine who was a Vietnam veteran but wasn't in that battle. And uh, Lonnie and I debated about what went on. And he was literally 20 yards from where I was. And at, and at the end of about an hour and a half of drunken debate, we, uh, my, my, our, our mutual friend said, were you guys in the same war? You know? I, mean, how, I mean, particularly being a novelist and trying to draw back on things, and, and my memory, I'm going like, well, well Lonnie was wrong. Right? No. But anyway, just curious how, how you deal with these sorts of uh, things. Exactly the same phenomenon in my life. My company commander in Vietnam, I was his RTO. I carried his radio. I was with him all the time. I'd sleep beside him. I was within three feet of him, connected by a cord. And you're maybe five, six years after the war had ended, he came to visit me. And I would ask him questions. Uh, what did you think about what happened on this day? And I would recount what I had, had remembered. And he'd look at me in puzzlement and say, I, I don't remember that. I remember this. And so it, it says a lot about, well, it says a lot about a lot. <laughs> one of which, one thing might be that one's angle of vision determines a lot of memory. If I'm looking over here, or if my concentration is on that radio, and the company commander is looking over there, and his concentration is on enemy movement, or we rarely saw the enemy move. They were, they'd do what we did, they'd hide. Right. But he'd be looking for it. And you'd come away from it with utterly different set of memories on both sides. And then you multiply that by the number of people in the battle, and then you multiply that by the people on the other side, the Vietnamese, you've got as many uh, battles as you have soldiers that were yeah. in the battle, different memories and uh, the, the temperament you bring to a war I, determines in part what you remember. I went to that war kicking and screaming. Didn't want to be there. I uh, hated the military life. I didn't like saluting my inferiors. <laughs> I, didn't like, uh, I didn't like getting up early. Just simple things like that. I hated it all. Yeah. I didn't like bugs, and God knows in Vietnam there were bugs. Uh, and that, so I, I have a filter over my memory. The things, I'm going to be looking for that which is going to uh, disturb me even further. And I'm not going to be looking for things that might, you know, pet me up. Right, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering also, I mean, you and I had different experiences because I was a lieutenant, and a platoon mm -hmm. commander, and, and you were an enlisted man carrying a radio around. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that has to temper your view of the war. Of course you know, it does, yeah. sure. Was, uh, I often wondered why we still have this sort of class structure left over from yeah. about the 14th century. Of, it seems like everybody ought to just go in the military, and then if they advance in rank, they sure. become officers or can go to the academies. But I often uh, talk to guys now, uh, and, and they go like, oh, yeah, well, you were an officer. You don't understand it. That same same. I agree yeah. completely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, you're absolutely right. That your rank, in part, determines. What if you're? What if you see the war from a B-52 airplane? What you have a different Vietnam than I had as a grunt. Or what if your job is a truck driver? So it's not just your rank. Your your memory of a war is determined by all these different variables. One of the things that I found really curious is that particularly with the film industry. The early parts of uh, depicting the war or writing about it uh, were very surrealistic. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, even going after Cacciato had a certain amount of surrealism. Yeah, what yeah. do you think was going on here? I think it was an effort to capture a kind of upside down value thing. 
As an example, I was brought up a Methodist in the plains of southern Minnesota. I was taught, thou shalt not kill. And I was told it was a commandment, not with no corollaries, uh, for, unless your country tells you to do it. There, that doesn't appear. And then flash forward nine years and you're told, as soldiers are always told, you'd better kill or we'll court-martial you, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, just in the most primal level, there's an upside-down quality to sanction violence. Things we're told not to do here, we're told to do there. And then you add, start adding layers on top of that basic thing, one of which is just youth. Right. You were young. It's forgotten how old soldiers are, those who are actually in combat. Yeah, the average age was 18 and 10 months. Yeah. And the uh, one result of just youth is the, the world goes upside down in a new way for you. If you've been through life a little bit, you can begin dealing with these, these, these collisions of the person you once were and the person you are now, because you're used to it. But when you're young, it's hard to do. The purpose, rather, is to, through fiction, for me at least, is to generate some kind of a feeling or emotion with it, so that there's a sense of what did it feel like to be in a war? Not literally what it was. You know, I, I, uh, I love the character Cacciato, who is actually hardly in the book. I mean, you know, he's know. this phantom, right? Yeah. You know, and yet there, there, there's something about him. And I was wondering as I was reading it, and now I get to ask you personally, I mean, did you fantasize about just getting up and walking to Paris and that that Cacciato image is actually something that helps you get through the war? It is. I mean, I dreamed about walking away from the war from the moment I went like this in Sioux Falls, <laughs> South Dakota. Um, they were, they, were, they were fantasies in the way, but they weren't the sort of, they weren't hobbity. They weren't, you know, full of strange creatures. It, they were very simple. In Vietnam, we would finish a day's, you know, march, and we'd dig our foxholes, and we'd set up a, a defensive perimeter on a hill. And in the final hour before dark, we'd sit at our foxholes, and talk and do horseplay. But I would remember looking up at the mountains in the distance thinking, you know, what's to stop me from going up into those mountains? It can't be any more dangerous than this is. <laughs> um, I have a weapon and I have rations and I have the weapon to get more rations. It's not as if it's, Im it's Im impossible. Um, and then one th when and we would sometimes even the guys supportive of the war would joke about it. I mean, even if you support a war, you don't like getting shot at. And you don't like watching people die. It's not a right. thing you like. And there's an, and so we joke about, yeah, let's do it. Let's just head up into those mountains. And if somebody would laugh and add a detail here and a detail there. The, uh, when one looks back through the, the, the books, the literature about war, the, the fiction about war that I admire, Almost all of it has at least some aspect of fleeing. Red badge of courage, Henry Fleming, you know, running from battle and then coming back to try to do better. Catch-22, the character of Orr, remember, mm -hmm. rowing for Sweden. Right. And even Yossarian himself doing everything he can That's to right. get out of the war. Go back to the Iliad, you know, the flight from battle. Uh, farewell to arms, all quiet on the Western Front, a slaughterhouse five escaping through imagination. Mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to think of a really beautiful work of art about the experience of human beings killing one another, which is what war is, I mean, in the end, that doesn't contain some aspect of the desire to get away from it because it's sane. Right. <laughs> it's sane to want to be out of it. On honorable terms, yeah, but still sane. I think it's a, it's a, it's a question that's it's kind of political, but I'm, I, I'd love to know where you are now after having experienced the Vietnam War. Um, is there any war worth fighting? Are you a pacifist? Well, I'm not a pacifist, but I'm about as close as one can get without being a pacifist. I, it's my belief that the wolf has to be at the door, and if it's not, I mean, you should think twice about killing people. 
In the end, war is one person saying to another person, I am so right, and you are so wrong, I'm going to kill you. Simple-minded, maybe, but not that far off from the reality. If you sort of elevate and go into the sort of the nation-state realm, you can make the equivalent that we're so confident of the rectitude of what we believe in, and we're so confident about the absence of virtue in the other side that we're going to kill for that purpose. Well, how many times in one's experience is that absoluteism of confidence there? That is, to kill people is a little more rare than our headlines are showing us. It, it is, uh, again, I don't mean it in a, it sounds political, but I don't mean it in a liberal, conservative mm -hmm. sort of way. I mean it in a commonsensical sort of way. When I, when I talk about questions like this, my, my, I have this fantasy of dumping a six-year-old corpse on the floor and then talking about it. So pacifist, no. But I think we ought to be a little more hard and ferocious and patient and determined uh, in, the, in the cause of peace with the same ferocity that we bring to waging wars and the same patience we have with fighting. Think how patient we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Pretty patient. If we brought those same qualities to bear on peace, which we, I don't think we do, I think we'd live in a much better world than we live in. Now, again, that sounds political, and I, I just got to swear to you that I don't mean it that way. I mean it in a very Midwestern, commonsensical, uh, we should be pretty sure it's right to kill people before we kill them. Yeah. No, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I often wonder if we're not getting ourselves into these sort of wars. I, I, uh, people ask me the same question, you know, and I say, well, I actually am not anti-war. I'm anti-stupid war. Yeah. I mean, I remember sitting around foxholes in Nam talking kind of about this subject, thinking, man, these people back there waging this war, I wish McNamara would come over here That's right. just for a day yeah. and walk with just me to this minefield. <laughs> just for a and not in some safe, you know, helicopter, you know, but not that there are any safe ones, but, you yeah. know, on the ground. What, 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 what does a, a former Marine and now a writer think about this issue of hypocrisy? Well, I think it's getting worse. Uh, if, I mean, it was bad enough. Um, but it's, because, it's getting worse because we're sort of hiring it out now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The draft did at least yeah. connect the country to the wars. It did. And uh, I mean, even in Vietnam, I mean, I was considered really odd because I'd gone to Yale and <laughs> I was a Rhodes Scholar. In fact, one of the better moments of my life there was I, after I'd been there about four weeks or five weeks and, you know, the kids finally figured out I was just an ordinary human being and they could talk to me. My almost 19-year-old squad leader comes up to me and he says, Lieutenant, are they shitting me about, you know, all, about you being a Rhodes Scholar and going to <laughs> Yale? And I said, no, they're really not. You must be the dumbest effing Rhodes Scholar they ever <laughs> But I think if there was anything from my experience, it, it, I came back with a profound uh, understanding of just how bad humans can be, mm -hmm. including myself. And uh, war, war can bring out the absolute best in people and it can bring out the yeah, absolute worst. I was so shocked to, to be alive. I mean, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I told you I didn't like Cub Scouts. I wasn't, I, did, I barely paid attention during basic and AIT, uh, advanced individual training, because I thought somehow something will rescue me from this nightmare, the God or the peace talks. Uh, it, I, it felt that this can't be happening to these hands and this head. So I went over to Vietnam ill-prepared in a military way and hence was really surprised that I, I got wounded. But I wasn't killed like so many brave, competent soldiers were. I learned that, that luck is <laughs> the main determinant of survival. Do you put your foot there or do you put it there? 
goes there, boom, the landmine goes off and your, your oatmeal. Put it there and you'll breathe. And then you do it repetitively with every step. That landmines in my AO were the main killer. There were all varieties of them. Every, everything from things we call toe poppers, which would blow off a foot, up to bouncing Bettys, which I'm sure you had to deal with, which would you know, you'd step on it, come out of the earth, and then explode. All the way up to you know, rigged artillery rounds. I mean, big, you know, you step, we had a whole uh, patrol, about nine guys had gone out from our, just for a little reconnaissance. And one guy came stumbling back through the perimeter, everybody else dead. Uh, so you come back from a war, and you feel as if you've been to Vegas, in a way, that, and have won. Only what you've won is not money, you've won the rest of your life by luck. Just luck. And uh, what do you do? You swear your way out of the army, you got on an airplane and headed back to Minnesota. And up there in that plane, I went into the back of the plane, I took off my uniform, uh, put on blue jeans and a sweater and a baseball cap, and vowed to myself that I was not going to take it off. I had one friend of mine who had served with me there, says, you know, and I wrote this novel for about 35 years, and he, and he came up to me and says, Marlanis, you're just picking a scab. Why don't you just let it heal? You know, and uh, I guess I, I you know, uh, and so in some ways it was, it was always sort of bringing it up, bringing it up, and, you know, my wife would know right away if I was into a hard passage in the book because, I mean, I'd be kicking her in the bed that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so in some ways you, I have to say that it, it exacerbated the problem. But in other ways, it somehow got it out. It's like you have these ghosts inside, um, and they haunt you. Mm -hmm. But if you put them out in front of you, then they don't haunt you anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what that process is. And, and there were many times that I would be writing a, a scene, and I'd just, I mean, suddenly there would be snot and tears on the, on the keyboard, <laughs> you know, because I, I would just lose it, yeah. completely lose it. Yeah. And, and I'd have to go outside, and I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't continue. Uh, Do you have those kinds of moments? Yeah, yeah. I would think if you're doing, if you're dealing with it honestly, mm -hmm. that, that's going to be because you can't, you can't get over it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just it's amazing can't. you use the picking of the scab analogy because my wife will tell you that that's the one I use. Is it's intentional. It's not like a habit that there are. I'm almost more afraid of forgetting and erasing because it means repetition for me. If I but if you remember the nastiness and, and that attends war that's beyond bombs and bullets and all the standard stuff, just the daily repetitive nastiness of it all, it's, it's easy to forget that stuff. And most veterans, I think, do. I think through the passage of time, you erase those long marches and those cold nights and those mosquitoes and ah, some of the racism. And, but a great deal of my war was on that daily brutality, and uh, uh, it was like being dipped in crankcase oil, just the evil on a daily basis. Not all that way, but enough of it to make me more deeply question what we were doing there. And it's easy on the 4th of July and on Veterans Day to remember only the heroic stuff, which there was plenty. But that is not the whole of war. So it's got another side, which is that crankcase oil side that's also part of war. And beyond that, it's got another dimension we almost never talk about, which is, in our case, the Vietnamese. It's as if there was no enemy. <laughs> right. We don't talk about them. Certainly not on Veterans Day, certainly not the 4th of July, as if we fought nobody. There's no enemy to talk about. And we just eradicate it from our memories and from our political rhetoric on those days as we lay the reeds. We did have an enemy, and you heard Carl and I talk about that enemy. They were, they were determined and they were good. Um, and as much as, you know, uh, an American soldier might believe in his cause, the other, the other side believes in its cause. You know, if you think the Taliban does, doesn't believe in their cause today, yeah. you're crazy. I mean, I know, I know you don't think that because you're smart people, but... But their one man's freedom fighter can be another man's insurgent. And one man's insurgent can be 
from their perspective, a freedom fighter. And it's best to bear in mind. And it's easy for me, especially as a veteran of the war, and I'm sure for Carl, the same way, is the questions are all about your service. Mm -hmm. But it's as if part of the equation has been evaporated by time, which was the equation he and I mostly thought about was, where are the Vietnamese and what do are, what are these people want? And they don't speak our language, are theirs. What is the, uh, how determined is that enemy? Why are they here? Are they here because they want to be? Why don't they just quit? Why don't they just stop? Yeah, yeah. let's call it a day. Call it a, call it a tie. That's right, let's yeah. Go home. <laughs> Thanks very saying. much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This program was made possible by the support of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund in partnership with the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. To learn more about these topics, visit pritzkermilitary.org. Thank you for joining us for Citizen Soldier. This program was sponsored by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund and is a production of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library.